Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Definitely gonna log in on here through my phone. Hopefully it's it's going through. Ah, yes, it's showing. Perfect. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shiloh. My parents, um, if you are joining me, oh, hello, Brittany. If you're joining me, I will ask you to grab a piece of paper of any kind, doesn't matter what color or um, if it's lined or anything, and grab a writing utensil, um, pen or anything like that. So feel free to grab those things. Um, and we're gonna do a small little activity and we're gonna discuss some stuff. So grab a piece of paper and a pen. And once you grab all those things and while you listen, um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to draw a large circle on the piece of paper. And after you draw a circle, you're going to draw about five lines going across the center to cut it up into about ten different slices. Um, and once you've done that, you'll add a second circle to cut the slices in half. So it's going to look like this. So let me just show you here. So this is what I want. Um, to kind of have you guys prep while I talk. Um, so yeah, so the larger circle with a middle circle and then about five lines going across, cutting it up into four, um, to ten pieces. So while you draw that, I will, I will talk. Um, so today we're going to be talking about privilege. Yay, I know that's everyone's favorite topic to talk about. Um, and I know that the term privilege is a loaded word, <laughs> um, but I want to emphasize that it is not meant to be a condemning word. Um, this activity is not meant to make you feel bad, um, but privilege shows us that there are things in this world that we may not experience or do not have to think about. Um, so some examples of some experiences that people may not have to experience or think about is um, when was the last time you were misgendered? Um, or when was the last time you had to hold in your pee so that you didn't have to use a gendered washroom? Um, when was the last time you feared for your life after getting pulled over? Or when was the last time you had to get food from the food bank? These are all questions and experiences that everyone in the world uh, may not even think about or have to think about. Um, and that's what privilege is. For many people, um, Privilege is that experience, um, and privilege itself um, doesn't mean that you have everything handed to you, um, or that you your life is somewhat easy, um, or that you've never had to work hard. Those are all experiences that you may still um, endure while having privilege, um, but the main focus of privilege is, is um, understanding and knowing that there are experiences um, that you don't you will never have to experience, and that is that in itself is privilege. And good afternoon, Richard. Thanks for joining. So today, um, we're going to be talking about the privilege wheel, hence the little circle wheel that you will be drawing um, right now. Uh, it'll help to provide an opportunity for us to connect and reflect on our experiences of having or not having any privilege. We will discuss the variety of privileges um, that the queer community and many other communities have um, or don't have. And it's not we're not going to look at just like legal privileges, but we're going to look at social and financial privileges as well. We will also be able to identify what privileges that we personally take for granted in our everyday lives. So um, before we keep going, and if anyone else has joined um, a little bit later, uh, we're going to be drawing one of these uh, privilege wheels. So it'll be one large circle, one little circle, and it's going to be split up into ten different slices. So while we talk about this today, um, I'm going to kind of go through a few terms that I like to discuss um, prior, just so that we're all on the same page um, and understand some of these words that I'll be I'll be talking about as well. 
So the first term we're going to talk about is the term prejudice. So this term means the preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual um, experience. So this is the attitude that people have towards different people. Um, so a prejudice towards the queer community could be anything like, you know, they're also very flamboyant, so they're all sexual, or um, essentially think of... Um, Oh, what's the word? Like, uh, stereotypes. Stereotypes is a, is a really great, um, visual of what a prejudice, what being prejudice is. On the flip side, when people have prejudices, oftentimes they will, um, have discrimination or do, um, discrimination towards other people. So this is the unjust or, um, yeah, the unjust treatment of different categories of people or things. And so this is the action side of, of hatred and things like that. Furthermore, so we, we start off with prejudice, which is the thoughts or the attitudes towards people. And then it shifts over to more of an action-based um, response to, to people. So discrimination could be, um, you know... Uh, not letting LGBTQ people uh, foster children. That was definitely a discrimination. Um, but we can go even a step further and talk about the isms or the phobias. And so this is um, with the connotation of power. So the addition of power with discrimination or with prejudice can then lead to these isms, such as, you know, homophobia, um, transphobia, racism, sexism, um, classism, any of those isms and phobias um, are a result of the prejudice, the discrimination, but also that addition of power. And because there's an addition of power, this means that any of the isms or phobias cannot be reversed. And so, for example, um, like a gay person cannot be homophobic to a straight person because there's no power behind anything that they say or do. Um, as much as it does suck and it still would be, you know, prejudice or discrimination, um, labeling it with the ism or the phobia is a little, uh, it, it doesn't work, uh, for example. A lot of people talk about this with um, reverse racism. Um, myself, personally, I believe that that does not exist. And the reason is, is because of the connotation of power. Another uh, term we're going to talk about a little bit is the idea of social construction. And so a lot of these, a lot of privilege comes from social constructions. Um, I haven't finished reading this book, but I have a book um, that's called The Social Construction of Reality. And so it's it, essentially in sociology, we talk about everything being a social construct, you know, gender, sex, um, constellations, you know, racism, all of those things are, are social constructions that we have made up and are accepted and upheld. And so, yeah, so the definition of social construction is the idea that an, an idea that has been created and accepted by the, the people in the society. And so once social constructions are created and upheld, when you are born into a society that has those certain social constructions, this is a term called socialization. So mostly this happens um, throughout your entire life, um, but a lot of it kind of starts and continues on in early childhood. So we see that it, socialization is a lifelong process by which group members learn and internalize the culture's values, beliefs, attitudes, and norms of a certain group or society. And so some of the things that we've been socialized with is, you know, um, that everyone is gay or everyone is straight unless they come out as gay or everyone is um, cisgender unless they come out as trans or, um, you know, gender is binary. Those kind of those are all different ways. Those are all different social constructions that we have been socialized to believe. Um, because our our wider culture and our wild wired wider society values those beliefs, and so we've been grown up in taught that, um, and now we ourselves are trying to unlearn it um, and change those beliefs. But many people still um, believe in those things, 
And lastly, um, just to define what privilege means, um, it is the systematic uh, advantages that individuals enjoy by virtue of their membership in a dominant group. With access to resources and institutional power, they are beyond and common advantages of marginalized citizens. And so, yes, it has nothing to do with how hard you work or where you are, and you have no choice, really, sometimes in in where you sit for privilege, but it is definitely a virtue that you get for being a member of a certain identity group, and it's something that you cannot change. But it's something that we can fight against, for sure. And so all of these terms, I know that might have been a lot, um, but they can easily be summed up in... Um, a sociological theory called symbolic interactionism. So symbolic interactionism um, is a micro-level sociological theory that focuses on the relationships among individuals within a society. So communication, so the exchange of meaning through language and symbols, is believed to be the way in which people make sense of their social worlds. So this um, sociological theory uh, really helps explain um, why people do uh, create constructs that we believe in um, and why we uphold those certain constructs as well. And so, so um, symbolic interactionism has three main parts to it. The first part is people act on the basis of the meanings that things have for them. The second one is the meanings come from and go from social interactions. So they are created, learned, repro and reproduced in our society. And three, we can modify our meanings as well. Um, and so this is the idea of unlearning and changing some of the beliefs that we do have. So now that we have this basis, um, we can start uh, filling in our privilege wheel. So here we're going to um, take the wheels that you drew right here and we're going to write on them. So make sure that you have it ready to go and if you have a pen or pencil, um, that would be really great as well. So for each slice, um, we're going to write down what groups go where and what identities fall into those groups. Um, we'll also discuss what experiences they get due to their placement on the wheel. So... We're gonna take this, and I'm gonna try to write with one hand. So, the first, here we go. The first one we're gonna focus on is the topic of geography. So, we have the topic of geography here. So there are different identities that fit into these categories of privilege. So the first one is, what is at the center? The center is um, the most valued um, identities and valued um, experiences of the world. And the outer rims are those who are marginalized. So in geography, um, a lot of people say that um, North America... that North America is at the center of this wheel. Um, anything in the West um, is seen and deemed as the more important. And here in the margins, we have, you know, first and second worlds, um, or even just poor countries. And so if you're living in a space where you are um, in Canada or in the US, your livelihood is often deemed better, um, and there's a lot of privileges that come from that, such as, you know, not having to hunt for food, um, having a roof over your head, having a stable income, those kind of things that may not exist or may be um, harder to obtain in um, second or third worlds, actually. That should be a three, third or second world countries. And so those experiences are very different depending on where you live or where you were born. The next category, oh, Pan, hello, I see that you just joined. 
if you joined late, we're creating this big wheel. Um, so we have a larger wheel, a smaller wheel, and we're cutting them up into um, slices of 10. So feel free to jump on that as well if you'd like. We're talking about privilege too, Pan. <laughs> um, the next category that we can look at is, um, I'm gonna write it on top so we have more room here. This one is gonna be the identity of gender. So this is gonna be at the top. So this is our focus group here. So the parts that are um, gonna be explained here is there's gonna be identities that are at the center and identities that are on the margins. So obviously when we think of gender, the first thing that I think of is men. But not just any type of man. We have to put in here um, cis men. And the reason for this is that on the margins we have trans people, um, we have cis women, we have genderqueer folks, and all of these folks have some sort of disadvantage in relation to cis men. So as much as you know, trans men like myself, we do still experience um, privilege of being identified as men. We still have a disadvantage of being a non-cis man. And so that's why we are still on this side. So here we can put cis women, we can put trans, uh, non-binary, or genderqueer um, folks. And so we have cis men at the center, and we have cis women, trans, non-binary, and genderqueer people on the margin. And the reason for this is that um, men throughout history have been seen to be the um, center of everything. <laughs> they hold the most power, they are the most represented in being, you know, managers, CEOs, politicians, anything like that. And so they're often at the center of privilege, where they've gained the most rights or have had the longest rights, whereas cis women and transgender queer folks often are left on the margins because of our identities for that. The next category that we're going to look at is the category of race. And so you can probably guess <laughs> what is going to go where with this one. This is probably the most common um, categorization that's, that gets talked about. Um, so the first one we're going to put um, at the center is white. And the reason we're putting white instead of Caucasian is that um, oftentimes we don't know the ethnicity of someone. Um, and as much as there's a difference in once you know someone's ethnicity, um, prejudices may happen. Uh, it's often based on how we see or view people. And so oftentimes you can't look at someone and guess what their ethnicity is. And so we base it off of skin color. And so that's why white is often at the center. Um, so for myself, I'm Métis, but I'm very white passing. And so because of that, I experience white privilege, even though I identify as indigenous. And so because of that, the people who are on the outsides are um, people of color. That's what the POC stands for. Also indigenous, um, indigenous folks. And as well as black folks. Like white passing Métis indigenous folks. LOL, you read my mind. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yes, exactly. There is a lot of people who, um, for example, are white passing, um, for sure. And the other reason why um, we put white is because it represents more than just ethnicity. Um, so, for example, even people who come from Asian descent, um, they most of them do have very fair skin like you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, even some folks who are of Asian descent, they may have very um, fair skin and they may look white. Um, but because of certain uh, other features, uh, they often get categorized with the people of color, um, just because 
oftentimes when we think of white privilege, we're thinking of, you know, the stereotypical, like, white Caucasian person. And so even though they may have the white skin, they may not be categorized as white, and vice versa, those who identify as, you know, people of color or indigenous may look white, they may be able to pass as white. So this one's very complicated, but those are the ways that we like to separate these two. The next category is, we're gonna put um, class. So class can also be known as wealth. Um, I've put down both of these, so we have class here. I'm assuming you may know um, what to put on which, so you can obviously put, you know, um, rich at the center here, and you can put poor on the margins. But even further than that, we can even categorize it in classes, right? So the rich, yes, they're rich, but the reason why they're at the center is because they are considered the, oh, I spelled that wrong. They're considered the leisure class. And the poor, people are often considered the working class. And the reason for that is if you have a lot of money, um, you're able to do a lot more leisure activities such as um, going on vacations, traveling, buying things you like regardless and not having to think of any of the money, um, taking time off, um, whereas working class folks often are working multiple jobs, making ends meet, living paycheck to paycheck, um, often don't get enough time for vacations or cannot afford vacations. And so that really has an effect on mental health. You know, if you're working one job and you get all the money you need and you're able to take vacations and relax, your livelihood's gonna be so much better. Whereas people who are poor and working, oftentimes they're working more than 40 hours a week. They're often working multiple jobs, um, still trying to make ends meet, still trying to buy food, keep a roof over their heads. And so the stress levels are higher and they're not able to take time off for vacation in order to, you know, rest or um, feel better. And so oftentimes they work themselves so much that they get so tired um, and they just live like that. And so that's the difference between, you know, the rich and the poor classes. The next category that we can look at is gonna be, um, let me just grab my other pen here. This one's interesting, it's uh, language. And many of you are probably thinking, what do you mean language? How is there privilege with language? Um, and it's actually quite important. In the center we can put English. And the reason why we put English is because at this point in time, English is seen to be the universal language. It is seen to be um, the international language. If you want to work in business um, or politics, English is usually um, very important to have. And that is why it's at the center. And the reason why is because all of those on the edge of language are other languages such as, you know, romantic, romantic languages. We have lost indigenous languages. And we also have, you know, radical um, languages. And lastly, accents. It's a huge part, accents. And so accents are also really important as well as other languages because those who, you know, move into Canada or North America, oftentimes people tell them, oh, you need to, you know, learn English or speak better or lose your accents. Um, and so English is often seen as that um, desired language. And even if you think about accents in a different way, if you think of, you know, other quote-unquote English accents, such as British accents or Australian accents, those accents are deemed as, you know, really attractive or easy to listen to or better to listen to. I remember seeing a um, interview done where they did a study where they had a language um, educator do the same workshop three times in a um, regular English accent, so like very, um, an accent that you would hear us speaking. Um, she did it in a British accent and an Australian accent, and all of them uh, were categorized differently. 
with how people felt, and a lot of the times the Australian and British accents were deemed better to listen to, um, made her seem smarter, and all those things. And so if you have an accent, you know, like an Asian accent, um, indigenous accent, um, any other accents, oftentimes they're seen as being poor, um, or that you have bad English, those kind of things. And that's why those are separated that way. The next category that we have here, Southern accents, such as Tennessee accents. Yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes those are regarded as being super posh. And so some people do enjoy those accents, but many times um, when you hear Southern accent, even like myself, I know I'm definitely prejudiced against Southern accents because I think of them being, you know, total like hillbillies or, um, you know, redneck, and I often get, myself, I already see my own my own um, prejudice and discrimination on those type of accents, right? So yeah, definitely, thank you for bringing that up, Brent. The next category we have here is age. And so this one might be harder to guess. I'm assuming, depending on where you're coming from when we're looking at age as a privilege, um, Many different ages may have their own types of privileges, depending on what kind of context you're looking for. But in a general societal context, we see that being um, middle-aged is the best. You know, you have all the money, you are working, you are in good health usually. Um, you're thought of as being smart and um, useful in a way. Whereas those who are um, elderly, or young are often on the margins. Um, so you see that uh, elderly people are often, you know, shipped off into old care homes. Um, sometimes they have poor health, so they're harder to take care of. Um, and they often don't get to be seen as uh, influential. Um, they're often just removed out of society. And with the young folks, I know many of you who are watching, we were all around the same age. And I know for me, I often feel inferior to people who are older because I'm so young and I haven't experienced life yet, quote unquote. Um, or a lot of young people are deemed as being um, not smart enough or not cultured enough. Um, and, and as queer people, we see that all the time where it's like, oh, you're too young to decide if you're gay or not, or you're too young to transition. And so these are, are other ways in which privilege comes into hand. Um, Brittany says, my cousins have Tennessee accents and they grew up in Tennessee and I totally get the hillbilly reference to it. <laughs> I'm glad you can relate to, to how I feel with those, um, those accents for sure. So now that um, age is there, sorry, holding a phone and trying to write is impossible. The next category we have here, we can label it dis with um, parentheses and ability. And the reason why I titled this one is that there's many different category uh, categories for this. We can even separate it into two separate categories, but for ease, I combine the two. So for this disabil or the disability um, section, those who are at the center of these identities are those who are, like myself, I am able-bodied. So that means I can move around, I can walk, I can lift things, I can sit for long periods of time. Although I do have back issues, I would still consider myself able body because I can I'm able to move on my own and I'm able to do things on my own that way. Um, and then instead of splitting the two, we can also um, add those who are um, neuro typical. I know it's probably hard to read there. So we have able-bodied and neurotypical. So those are at the center margins. These are people that, um, like myself, I consider myself able-bodied and neurotypical. I do not have any learning disabilities. Um, my brain works in a way that is 
um, suited to how society is set up. And so I am able to use those parts of my body to have privilege in society. Whereas those who, you know, on the margins may be disabled, um, this can mean many different things. This can be physical disabilities, such as, you know, um, using wheelchairs, using walkers, um, you know, having missing limbs, missing fingers, being blind, being deaf. Um, there's also invisible disabilities, such as mental illness um, or anything like that. And then also on this category, category we can put neuro, oh, neuro diverse. And these are folks um, who oftentimes have autism. They like to categorize themselves as being neurodiverse because having autism doesn't mean that you have anything wrong with you, um, but it's just that you experience and think of the world in a very different way. And oftentimes our society and our world is built to privilege those who are able to, you know, walk upstairs, you know, um, drive cars, take transit, um, be able to go to schools and, and listen and learn without any other help. Um, and those who, you know, are, are using wheelchairs, using walkers, getting around our world is often harder, especially with stairs, lack of ramps, lack of elevators, um, not having places to sit, and also places that are very loud. You know, there's, there's a really great movement happening with grocery stores that are making, um, quiet times where they have like all the lights kind of dimmed, no beeping sounds, and those things that to help folks who are, um, who have disabilities and may not be able to um, function in a space that is super loud and a lot of people. And the next category we have here, um, which I think is very re um, relevant, is religion. A lot of people don't see religion as being a privilege, um, but it, but it is. Um, those who do identify with a religion have their own privileges and disadvantages. Um, I would say those without religion are often on the in the center as well, just because our societies have become more secular, and so I would put like um, an R for no religion at the center. But even if you do identify with a religion, um, I would say uh, Christianity is at the center. And the reason for that is, you know, even in, in our society right now, the only time where almost every single store in all of our, um, in our city is often Christmas, you know, and that is a Christian holiday. Yet we don't have any special days off where it's, you know, um, Eid, for example, which will be happening in a few weeks. Um, or other holidays like Fasek. We just talked about Fasek for um, Buddhism, and they don't have that day off as a national holiday. And so those kind of things kind of dip into um, what religion has power and which one does not. And so here we can put all the other religions. I'm just going to name a few. Um, such as, you know, Muslim, um, Jewish, we can even put Hindu, and there's many others that we can put in there, um, as there are hundreds and hundreds of different religions. Um, but the one at the center is often Christianity or having no religion at all. Now we got two more categories. Um, the first one that we're going to talk about is education. Education is a huge category that we can talk about. So for this one, many of you might think, you know, any education could be at the center of this category, but not quite. Those who believe um, that post-secondary is at the center um, here, because those, you know, have um, graduate degrees, uh, undergraduate degrees, doctorates, um, PhDs, all those folks who have some sort of post-secondary um, education are often seen as, you know, better, um, 
more educated, um, all of those different ways that you can describe them. And they're often, they often get better jobs, you know, um, they often get um, better advantages with being, with, with having a post-secondary um, education. And all the educations that fall in the margins are any informal um, education. Um, so this could be, you know, education from family, um, friends. This could be, you know, tickets. This could be, you know, workshops, anything like that. And there's also um, non-institutional education as well. And this could be, you know, education from elders, education from religious areas, um, education from family. So essentially any education that is non post-secondary is often on the margins of this wheel. And last but not least, we are on our last category here. And this category, as many of you may know, is going to be sexuality. This one, I'm assuming a few of you may <laughs> uh, know at least one part of this, this section to be at the center, and that is heterosexual. So the folks who are heterosexual are often at the center of this margin um, because our society values those who are um, straight and those who are, you know, LGB, so LGB plus, are often on the margins because of their sexual identities. Another category that we can fit in here is also the category of, you know, having sex. So those who are heterosexual are often in the, in the center, but also heterosexual people who are sexual are often at the center of this um, wheel as well. And that is because those who, you know, are asexual or demisexual are often seen as weird, um, they often are seen as not fulfilling our human duties of procreating. Um, and so, yeah, the idea of having sex and having straight sex is often deemed as being um, valued with um, valued higher than any other identity uh, because that is the way to, you know, make children. That is the way that marriage is supposed to be. You're uh, with quotes there, <laughs> supposed to. Um, and so, yeah, so those who are asexual um, or LGB, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, all of those um, are often left on the margin. So now, if we look at it this way, we see that we have all of our categories all the way around. We see that we have all of the identities that fall on the margins. And we see what is valued here at the center. These are the identities that people strive to be or would like to be. And these are the identities that are often in the best place of power, are often in the best place of um, gaining uh, positioning, getting better jobs, anything like that. So now that we have all of these written down, I would like you to take a pen and a circle and circle all of your identities that you may have. And this will help you visualize how close or how far you are away from the center. So you're going to join me with that. I'm going to highlight it here. I'll go through each one. So gender. So for me, myself, I identify as a man. But because I am not cisgender, I would often be in the margins because of that. But because I do identify as a man and I pass as a man, which means people often see me as being a cis man by accident, I would say I'm more in the center here where I kind of flip from one side to the other, depending on the context that I am in. Race. Here, I'm definitely going to put white. <laughs> um, I am white passing. I definitely see myself as being white passing. Even though I do have... Um, indigenous here one second indigenous uh, identity i often do not get confused as being indigenous so again with my gender and with my with my male passing and my white passing i am often in the center of both of these here next here um with class i would say I am definitely working class. I still, unfortunately, live paycheck to paycheck. 
Um, I have a lot of loans that I pay for for school. Um, thankfully, uh, I consider myself not poor as I am able to um, provide for myself, have a roof over my head, have food every day. Um, but I'm still a working class citizen. I do not have the luxury of going on trips and buying everything I would like. Um, so that would be where I am at. Language. I only know one language, and it is English. So I'm very, very privileged to know that. Um, and I do not have any accents. Uh, some people may say that I have an in, um, a Canadian accent, uh, but I, th I think that one would still also apply. Um, for being in in there. Now age, I identify um, being still pretty young. I wouldn't consider myself middle-aged yet. Um, I still have a lot of disadvantages for being the age that I am in certain contexts. Um, a lot of people still don't take me seriously because of my age, so I would consider myself so margined for that, but give myself another 10 years and I'll be thrown into the middle class there. Um, disability, um, I would consider myself very privileged on this end. I am able-bodied, um, and I am also neurotypical, for sure. I'm able to get around, I am able to drive, I, um, don't have any learning disabilities, um, anything like that. If anything, I would say, um... I, you know, I have glasses, <laughs> but a lot of people do have glasses, and that is something that is not hindering of my life. Um, Pan says, back at language, I think if you know multiple languages, you are given a privilege. Ooh, yes, that's a great point, um, going back to, to language here. Um, yeah, knowing multiple languages can be a privilege as well. Um, unfortunately, I would say if one of those language if if you know multiple languages and you don't know the language of English, um, I would say you're cons you would still be considered on the margin. Um, but yes, definitely. If you know English and you know like five other languages, that is awesome. That is bizarre. And so kudos to those people. That takes a lot of work and a lot of um, time and energy to learn those uh, languages. So yeah, definitely. Knowing multiple definitely gives you a higher privilege in, in most contexts for sure. Um, religion. Uh, I would say I have the privilege of being Christian. Um, I do not identify as being Muslim, Jewish, or Hindu, um, or any other religions. I do dabble in a bunch of those, and my focus in theology, other than queer theology, was multiple religions, and so I do know quite a bit about all of these religions, and I do find myself in those spaces quite often. Um, but I'm in those spaces more so as a visitor, and so I would say that I consider myself privileged with, you know, working for a Christian um, church, um, having a Christian uh, education, and growing up in a Christian society. Education. Um, I have two post-secondary certificates. I have a certificate in biblical studies and Christian discipleship, and I also have a double major um, Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology and theology. So I would consider myself very privileged in I am a very low percentage of, of folks who have obtained a post-secondary degree. Um, so my education and my knowledge is deemed as quote unquote more important than any other um, education that people may learn, which I think is absolutely wrong, but that is unfortunately how our society is um, programmed. And lastly, um, sexuality. Uh, <laughs> this one actually changed for me. Um, I used to be here when I identified as a lesbian, um, but after transitioning, my sexuality has not changed, and thus me being now male, I still am attracted to and do date people who are female identified, which throws me in the category of being heterosexual. And I do engage in sexual activity, um, or have anyway, um, so I would consider myself sexual. I do not identify as asexual at all, um, and so I would be at the center for this one as well. And lastly, geography. Um, I was born and raised in Canada. Um, I was born in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and have lived in Edmonton since I was three months old, and I have not left. <laughs> so I would consider myself very, very privileged in, in this way as well. I do live in North America. I live in a first world country. 
I am able to get all of the things that I wish to obtain, such as food, shelter, um, family, I can have a job, I can have money, I can have disposable income, anything like that um, really helps here. And so now if you look at it, I am very centered. I have a lot of privilege, and this is something that I am working on being aware of. Uh, I know many of you, if you've been drawing and writing your own, your highlights may look very different than mine. Um, and that's the point, is that we all have different identities here. And so, you know, if I would have done this activity six years ago, it would have looked very different. You know, I would have considered myself being very poor. I would have considered myself, you know, being even younger. I would have had... Um, I wouldn't have been Christian at the time. Uh, I would have been a lesbian, so I would have been on the margins for this one. Um, I wouldn't have been trans. I would have been considered a cis woman instead. Um, so all of these things kind of, you know, some of these privileges and identities do change. Um, sometimes voluntarily or not, you know, if someone comes out or if someone transitions, those things change. You know, if someone goes to school, that'll change. If someone learns a new language, that would change. You know, sometimes maybe um, diseases uh, that may happen later in life may cause some sort of disabilities, um, accidents even. And age, you know, everyone gets older. And so eventually that will change for you as well. And so another thing to touch on is that a lot of these categories actually um, influence each other. So, for example, because I have had post-secondary education, that allows me to get a better paying job, which would then increase my wage, which would increase my leisure activities. Um, and so that could be a huge example of that. Um, or even, you know, um, moving to a different country. That will, uh, folks who move to North America, they have better... Um, chances of getting post-secondary education, getting a better um, job, low, uh, heightening their their economic class. And there's other things, you know, learning English. That could be a huge thing that people can do too. And so a lot of these are interconnected. And so before we talk about the interconnectedness of all of these, I'm going to shift it back on me so you can see me and I don't have to hold it. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are still listening, um, I know this is a very long um, live stream here, but how did this activity make you feel? I know it can be sometimes deeply triggering or frustrating activity because perhaps you don't have access to a lot of these privileges and seeing all of the privileges in a list can be very, very challenging. And for others, it can be deeply moving or deeply emotional because they've never thought of all of the privileges that they do have before. Um, this can bring up feelings of guilt or even feelings of shame for taking these um, privileges for, for granted, you know. Um, so I'm going to ask you, like, how did this activity make you feel? Is there any responses or reflections that this activity caused you to personally have? Was there anything on this list that surprised you? Um, have you ever not thought about, you know, language before as a category? Um, a lot of times people don't realize all of the privileges that they have taken for granted. And that is often because privilege is invisible to those who have it. It's something that you have to actively search for, actively view, and actively reflect on, which is why I like this activity so much, is that it really throws it out there. It really shows you all of the categories that you can have privilege in, because most of the time, you know, I don't think about my me knowing English as a privilege. Like, I often don't think about that, especially now in where I'm at. You know, if I went to another country... For sure. I would definitely notice that, like, me knowing English is very profound because there's other people that know English um, all over the world. And so, to end off, we're going to talk about um, why we didn't just focus on LGBTQ identities. We could have easily done this and categorized it in four different slices and talked about, you know, um gender expression, we could have talked about um, biological sex, we could have talked about sexuality, and then also the reasonings for um, um, sexuality. One second, we're gonna see. Pan, I had to think about age. Am I middle-aged? Potentially. Um, it depends on the context, I would, I would suggest. I think um, 
as a result of this activity, um, most times when people are referring to middle age, they're talking about um, people who are usually within their 30s and 40s. Um, that is considered middle age. Um, those categories of people are often seen as, you know, the best. They're they're not too old and they're not too young. And they, you know, they got life um, figured out. They have really good paying jobs. Their careers are jump-started. They have families. That's why middle-aged people are seen as being um, the best <laughs> in a way. So I would say for, for you and myself, we're still pretty young um, in comparison. But depending on where we are in... Um, context that sometimes changes uh you said i concluded that i am still young because i am not given respect due to my experience or life accomplishments i still do have don't have a career path or life or family i'm 32 yeah so exactly yeah so it, as much as it is it is about like an age number it's also um about experience as well and th i'm glad that you brought that up this idea of life accomplishments and that's exactly um kind of what the age category tries to get at is that, you know, when we're young like this, like we, ha we have nothing going for us essentially is what's what they're trying to get at. And so um, if you look at like, you know, politicians, for example, um, a lot of them are, you know, 40s, 50s. Um, they have their families going, their careers are great um, and they have everything figured out. And those who are elderly or those who are very young, especially kids, like, you know, kids are often you know, seen as, you know, you know, you're too dumb, you're too young, you have no idea what you're doing. Um, and so we see that a lot. So yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. That's a great reflection for sure. Um, and so yeah, so to end off on this live stream, um, a lot of you may, or a lot of you may wonder why we didn't just focus on the LGBTQ identities. And the reason for that is um, intersectionality. And so intersectionality um, is the uh, interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender, and even more, as they apply to a given individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. And so the concept of intersectionality is intended to illuminate dynamics that have often been overlooked by feminist uh, theory and movements, so there's an author by the name Bell Hooks, um, and they talked about the uh, notion that gender was a primary factor determining a woman's fate. And historic, historical exclusion of black women from the feminist movement in the United States resulted in many um, black 19th and 20th century feminists, such as Anna Julia Copper, um, challenging their historical exclusion. So this disputed the ideas of earlier uh, feminist movements, which were primarily led by white middle age and middle class women, um, resulting that women were uh, a category that shared the same life experiences. But however, one established that the forms of oppression experienced by white middle class women were often very different than those experienced by black, poor or disabled women. So feminists began seeking ways to understand how gender, race, and class combined to determine the female destiny. And one of the, the one of the great ways um, that I learned about this was there's a story that goes around that talks about. Um, I'm pretty sure this is how Kimberly Crenshaw um, stated it, but there was a story that there was two women. There was a black woman and a white woman, and they were asked to step up in front of a mirror and look at themselves and to answer the question, what do you see? So the white woman goes up to the mirror, she sits in front of the mirror and she looks at herself and she says, I see a woman. And that was it, that's all she saw. And so she left and then the next turn was the black woman's turn. And so she goes up to the, the, the mirror and she looks at herself and she says, I see a black woman. And so that, that was the, the distinctiveness of um, the idea of intersectionality is that oftentimes, you know, white, white women, they often just see themselves as women. They don't see themselves as a white woman. Whereas folks who are black or women who are black, they often see themselves as both a black woman. They can't see themselves as just being black or just being women. Their experience is both being a black woman. And so in 1989, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is an amazing woman, 
coined the term intersectionality in a paper uh, as a way to help explain the oppression of African-American women. So Crenshaw's term is now at the forefront of national conversations about racial justice and identity politics and policing. And over the years, she has helped shape legal discussions. She used the term in her crucial um, 1989 paper um, for the University of Chicago Legal Forum, and she called it um, demarginalizing the intersections of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine, feminist theory, and anti-racist politics. What a long title. Um, it's amazing work. Definitely read it if you can. Um, and in her work, Crenshaw discusses black feminism, arguing that the experience of being a black woman cannot be understood independent terms of either being black or a woman. So rather, it must include the interactions between these two identities, which she adds, she would frequently reinforce the other. And so that's why when we talk about, you know, privilege and oppression, we often have to look at all of the categories. We can't just look at, you know, the oppression of being trans or the oppression of being queer or gay or lesbian. Um, as much as those are oppressions themselves, a lot of people experience multiple different oppressions. And that's why we have this huge movement of, you know, trans and queer people of color um, or QT BIPOC people that, you know, are, are frustrated about, you know, pride and those things where they're saying, you know, there's so much more about the queer experience that we experience as being people of color and queer. Um, that experience is so much different than just being queer or just being, you know, people of color. And that combined identity has a whole other experience that no one else can understand. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read some of these comments here. Brittany says, I'm definitely still young because I'm 20, but I do have a, a grasp on career and higher education with being in my college program. Exactly, yeah. And that's the other thing, too, is um, age... A lot of people don't know ages. A lot of people often um, assume age too. And so people who may look older or look younger may receive or may receive privilege or may not. I know for me, I looked a lot older than I did. Um, a lot of people think I'm a lot older than I am. <laughs> um, and so that helps me and that provides me some privilege in certain spaces. Um, and there's other folks that I know who, like my partner, she looks like she's 12, <laughs> essentially, in some in some spaces. So a lot of people don't take her seriously, even though she's older than me. Um, and so that's another another um, way of seeing how, how age takes place in that. Um, Pan says, I also didn't feel privileged with English. Since traveling, it would be better to have a second language, but realizing how important it is in a larger context. Totally, yeah, yeah. And, th and that's the other thing, too, is that when we take a look at all of these category categories, a lot of them come from a, a Western understanding. So a lot of these... Um, a lot of these categories may change depending on where you are in the world um, and what time you are in the world. Um, so, for example, you know, being in a, in a Muslim country, uh, Islamic country, being Christian, that would be on the margins for sure. Um, and being Muslim would be at the center. Um, or being in a space that doesn't have any English as a second language. Um, knowing English wouldn't help you, <laughs> but knowing the, the language of the country would. Um, so a lot of these things can shift and change depending where you are in the world. Um, but for, for us here, you know, living in Edmonton, living in, in Canada and North America, this is kind of how our city is Edmonton, our city, um, our country of Canada, um, sees and values these certain categories. And so that's why I think it's important to do this activity, to, you know, see where you sit in this wheel, um, where your identity, where your identities lie. Um, and it helps you just be more aware because that's the first step of understanding and understanding your privilege is being aware of it. And so that's what I hoped to, to accomplish today with all of you um, to kind of lay out what categories there are and where you sit and where you get privilege and where you don't. And this is a really great starting point to kind of reflect on ways that you can change um, how society sees it or change ways in which you act and benefit from these certain privileges. Oh gosh, it's been an hour. So yeah, I'll definitely leave you all on that. If you did make one of these um, little wheels, uh, if you made it during the live stream or if you made it after, if you're watching this later on, please feel free to send me photos of it. I'd love to see 
um, kind of where you all are at and if you've created it a little bit fancier than I did. Um, so yeah, send me photos of these if you have created one. I would love to see those. And yes, thank thank you, Pan. Thank you for, for joining. Um, oh, Pan, before you leave, next week I'll be doing the um, Robertson Wesley Affirming United history of the affirming process. I've been doing some um, research and talking to some people that were there during the process. So it's just taking me a little bit more time to kind of hear everyone's stories and, and ask them questions. So I should have that done and that'll be the focus for next Monday at noon. Um, so stay tuned for, for that and the history of the affirming process for Robertson Wesley. So I'm excited for that one. I've been working on it all week, but I didn't want to rush it. I wanted to have a bigger, fuller story. So there's a few people I still want to reach out and talk to before I before I do that. So thank you everyone for joining me. Um, like I said, again, please send me photos if you've done your wheel. Um, and I really hope this was a great way to reflect and have you ponder what um, privileges you have for the week. Um, and maybe be a little bit more aware of that. And if you have any other further questions or, or um, reflections, um, please feel free to message me. I'd love to chat about this a little bit more. I love talking about privilege. Um, it's one of my favorite workshops to do, um, and it was one of my focuses for sociology. So I'd love to talk about it. So please reach out if you have any more questions, and I will see you all next Monday at noon. And if you are still wanting to do stuff for the rest of the day, I know Laura is doing the Spirited Arts um, workshop tonight at seven o'clock. So stay tuned for that. And I will see you all next Monday. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.